uh, tablet PC didn't work uh, last time. So I have, you know, tried to make a <coughs> sense of um, what I wrote on the board. So you have the notes if you need them. Um, <coughs> about this homework, I didn't write solutions, but I, I guess I should start writing solutions. Um, I've seen quite a few um, <coughs> mis, um, mishaps in the in the homework, so um, let me see if I can address some of them. Uh, oh yeah, there was that uh, question number nine. Was saying find a solution of that non non autonomous system. And then then well find the general solution. So what does it mean a general solution? <clears throat> general solution means formula that, that uh, captures all solutions, right? All possible solutions. So, of course, you know, when you do separation of variables, I mean, how do you find the solutions? You try separation of variables, of course, you have to uh, worry about x equals zero, x being equal to zero. So, okay, everybody did this. And you end up with a solution e to the integral of a of t dt. Okay, so everybody said, okay, this is, well, almost everybody, this is the formula that gives a solution of this problem. Um, you have to put this constant because <clears throat> to take care also of the solution x equals zero, x being equal to zero, right? So for instance, that's an example of um, a non-autonomous system that has a steady state, right? <coughs> a, 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 a depends on t, so the right-hand side is uh, de explicitly depending on t, right? Periodic, non-periodic, doesn't, any anyway, uh, <clears throat> x equals zero is a solution. Right? It's a steady state. And in fact, it's the only steady state. Right? So how do we how do we show that something is a general solution? What does it mean, general solution? Ninety-nine percent of the students actually um, <clears throat> verify that this is a solution, which is part of the problem. But what, yeah, what is that? <clears throat> well, generally means to show that this uh, covers all solutions, right? So in our plane. What would it mean? It would mean that you start with any any point, right? <clears throat> X naught, T naught, and there is a, there is a curve given by this formula that gives that uh, that goes to this point, right? In fact. Um, so, in other words, to show that for any given point, any initial condition, there is a constant C that gives that particular, uh, that, that satisfies that particular initial condition. Right? So, uh, to show that this gives the general solution um, we need to uh, to find 
C uh, such that x of t naught equals x naught. Okay. For all possible sort of uh, initial conditions. Now, of course, there will be initial conditions where there is no solution, right? But wherever there is a solution, that is given in this form. do that. Well, the problem is with this indefinite integral. Where when it's indefinite, then there is no clear way how to find the constant of integration, right? So we replace the indefinite integral by a. We have to put some limits of integration, right? So what, what kind of limits do we put? Usually it's x naught, uh, t naught, excuse me to t, right? So that's another way of <coughs> writing. And plus plus another constant of it, arbitrary constant, right? That would give you the indefinite integral. But of course, e to the constant at times can be incorporated in front of the exponential. So it's just the same as putting c to the, right? And now when t equals t naught, x of t naught has to be x naught, so this is c to the integral from t0 to t0. Of course this is 0. e to the 0 is 1, so it's just c. So the constant is x naught. So that gives you, you know, that the uh, particular value of the of the constant for any initial condition, which says what? It says I have this is this is part of the general solution, right? But it's a, it is the particular solution that satisfies the uh, the particular initial condition. Okay? So that's why when you write a general solution of a differential equation, you want to capture all solutions. And <clears throat> another thing you can show is that there is a unique sort of uh, the solution is unique. There's, there, there are no two solutions that go through that initial condition. Again, by you know you by having the formula unique function f uh, x x of t that gives you that uh, goes to this point, right? So for this kind of equations, there's nothing that can go really wrong. And why is that? Because what do we say? <clears throat> the right-hand sides of an equation um, can give you troubles as far as you know having a unique solution or having a solution. Period. What what could be a? I mean, we saw in the the other example in the homework, x to the one third, right? What was wrong with the x to the one third in the right hand side? Hmm? It's not defined as the derivative is not defined at zero, right? So it's discontinu the derivative is discontinuous. Where here the the derivative with respect to x is just well, it's linear in x, so it's a linear equation, right? So we'll see that you know whenever we are in the realm of linear equations, everything goes nice and smooth, and we can find solutions, um, even though there are some coefficients that are in de depending on t. So t dependent coefficients, non-autonomous. Um, I've seen a few comments about <clears throat> another problem. I think it was. Um, so I wanted to make sure that you go back and look at 
Um, there was the question of show that there are infinite amount of solutions to this, and we talked about it last time. But um, <clears throat> the the problem, the, the 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 slope field, the direction field of this differential equation is t independent. There's no t dependence here, right? The solution depends on t, of course. You write x a function of t, but the equation is is autonomous, so there's no. So the the slope field is is translational invariant. There is, right? The other one, x over t. This is this is non-autonomous, right? So the property of, a, of an equation to be to have s sort of unique solution through a point or multiple solutions through a point usually has nothing to do with uh, being uh, the equation being autonomous or non-autonomous. Right? It has to do with the how the uh, right hand side behaves as function as a function of x. Okay? Now for instance, this x prime equals a x over t is linear in x. Right? So it's just like the one on top with a of t equals 1 over t. And the solutions are, of course, if you do the, the separation of variables, right? What were the solutions? c times t, right? So I don't know when. In, in, in your introductory course, uh, ODs, how much you've actually dr uh, drawn the pictures of the solutions. But here is extremely important to have this always handy. <clears throat> Plot solutions if you can. Um, this would be right. This is not translation invariant. This picture is not translation invariant. This is a non-autonomous system. Are there unique? Is there unique solutions? Given our initial condition, no. Why not? Well, everything goes in the limit goes to zero, right? But you see, when t is zero, there is no. I mean, this differential equation is not defined at when t equals zero, right? So, if the question is, you know, um, initial condition at a time that is not zero, then the answer is there's a unique solution, right? If the question is, so unique solution. If the question is, um, find solutions that satisfy this, well, the answer is, there's no solution that satisfies, you know, that, that takes the value 0, 0. But there are lots of solutions that have the limit as t goes to 0, equal to 0, right? So many times we call this not an initial value problem, but a limit sort of value problem. You take it in the limit. Okay? So this would be a limit value problem. And it's important to distinguish between the two. When, you know, uh, you're allowed to take a value for, for, for the t or for x and when not. Uh, let's see. Um, any other questions from this first chapter before we move forward? So we'll come back. We'll come back and talk more about existence and uniqueness. We'll, we'll come back uh, 
on Poincaré map. Um, the moment we 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 talk about two-dimensional problems in um, well, I think two-dimensional is, is plenty enough to see sort of the, the range of pro, uh, you know the complexities that that uh, arise when we study this Poincaré map for for planar systems. Um, so. Let's move away from one equation to two equations now. So we're going to talk about uh, planar systems. And in the first lecture, we I kind of showed you a few equations or systems of equations that, um, that may arise. Um, For a system of two equations, they're always going to look like this. There's always going to be uh, two variables, x1 and x2. <clears throat> so most general uh, system of two, equa two differential equations with two um, variables, unknowns, x1, x1 of t, and x2, x2 of t. Okay? So what's the difference from having just two isolated equations uh, that, that we, we studied about before? Well, you can see that, that the first equation also has on the right-hand side the, the second variable, and the second equation has on the right-hand side the first variable. So if these appear explicitly, then we say that this is a system of coupled equations, okay? Because, I mean, if there would be no x2 in the first equation and next no x1 in the second equation, then you would treat the first equation as x1 as a function of t. You would have a nice, you know, x1 versus t, uh, and it would be independent of what x2 is, and vice versa, right? So it'd be decoupled. But this really are um, so. For instance. This system is a couple or decouple. Decouple, right? So we could we could solve this uh, first equation dependent on the second equation, right? <coughs> Decoupled um, system, and we could say what x one is is x one at 0, uh, e to the t, and x2 of t, so x1 of t, and x2 of t is x2 of 0, e to the minus t. Okay? And we've solved it. Okay? In contrast, let's, let's do this. X, x1 prime equals x2, and x2 prime equals minus x1. This one is coupled system, right? And you cannot solve for x1 for independently of x2. Okay? So that's obviously uh, more complicated. Now, we can still solve this, this particular one, because it's of a spe very special uh, structure, and that is Uh, one method, sort of ad hoc method, to solve this system would be um, take this, write a second order equation in x1. 
so decouple it. But I mean, you cannot do this in general. But if you if you were to do x1 double prime, which is x2 prime, which is minus x1, it means x1 double prime plus x1 is zero. Okay, and that's a second order constant coefficient homogeneous equation in x1, which can be solved by characteristic equation r squared plus 1 equals 0. So just reminding you, um, where does this come from? This comes from uh, seeking or setting or seeking solutions of the form e to the rt, right? If you plug this in, derivative twice gives you r squared, right? e to the rt plus e to the rt, so r squared plus 1 times e to the rt is 0. So this is the characteristic equation, and you get r equals plus and minus i, right? So x of x one of t is ends up being what? C one e to the i t plus c two e to the minus i t, right? Because you can have <clears throat> and of course e to the i t is a complex expression, so you need to change it into real, right? So what's e to the i t is cosine t plus i sine t and what's e to the minus i t? The complex conjugate, so it's cosine t minus i sine t. Okay, these are um, if you want conventions, that's what e to the i t means. Okay, And these are two arbitrary constants, c1 and c2 which if you recombine if you combine the real part and the imaginary part and put sine and cosine next to each other I mean excuse me the separate sine and cosine rename the constants then you get that x1 is a combination of sine and cosine right so x1 of t is is this, and x2 of t is the derivative of x1 of t, or minus. No, x2 is x1 prime, so it's minus c1 sine t plus c2 cosine, right, derivative of sine is cosine, okay, and that's the solution of that coupled system. Okay. Uh, Do you get an insight from writing the explicit solutions um, of this or the previous one? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. Depends on uh, what specifically you want from the solutions. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to represent them, sort of, and write a general solution. Okay, general solution of that of that system or of this system. But what's the best way to represent the general solution? I mean, we wrote them down, right? But let's represent them uh, graphically. Okay? So graphically, let's see. Um, well, let's plot a few solutions like this. So, how do we how do we plot just a particular solution? This is a general solution. How do we plot a particular solution? 
just take two values of the constants, right? So C1 tilde is 1 and C2 tilde is 0. Then what's X1 is cosine? X2 is negative sine, right? So let me use green for, so this is cosine. So that's x1. And x2 is sine. Let me use red for that. So it's, uh, excuse me, it's negative sine. So it's So what am I doing here? I'm plotting both components versus T. This is X2. Again, any, any idea of how maybe different, another combination of C1 and C2 would give you the solution? Like initial conditions would would give you the the solution. So again, this corresponds to C one is one and C two equals zero. Well, that's not very. Uh, telling about the general solution, right? It does show you how a particular solution behaves, right? But it doesn't really tell you how a different solution might behave, okay? But if I, if I do the following, if I um, square the first one, and I square the second one and I add together. And of course you'll ask why, but let's just do this. Um, <clears throat> then what's going to happen? The square of the first, right, is the first one squared, cosine squared, the second one squared, sine squared with the constants, plus twice the product. And the second one is going to be the same, but it's going to be minus twice the same product. So the, the middle terms will, will cancel. And then you're going to have C1 tilde squared times cosine squared plus C1 squared sine squared. So that's C1 squared. C2, t C2, C2 squared is again the same. It's going to have one sine squared and one cosine squared. So sine squared and cosine squared is going to be one plus so this this is the end this is the answer of that and this is t independent so you see it's more advantageous if i plot in the x1 x2 plane if i plot what If I plot x1 and x2 as being, you know, the coordinates of the point, x1, x2, uh, at each time t. Okay. So if I do that, you know, that's, you recognize this to being the equation of what? x1 squared plus x, x2 squared equals a constant. Circle center of the origin. Right? Now, what radius? Well, depends on these constants. Like if C1 is 1 and C2 is 0, then it's going to be a radius 1, right? And now here's the most important thing is is you also have to, uh, I mean, a circle is a circle. You can plot it, right? As round as you can. Um, but is that a solution? 
So you, can you say the solution is a circle? And the solution is a curve, right, in this plane. So it's not, the circle is the trajectory, but it's not, it's the um, trace of that solution, right, on the plane. But to actually show what the solution is, you have to say it's a, you know, as time evolves, what is that point doing, right? So you have to sort of parameterize the, the, the circle. You see, you need to know an initial condition, and you need to know um, <clears throat> how you know how that uh, sort of the in this case the circle is is described, is parameterized. Okay. So let's say let's say we have an initial condition where x one, this one above here. X1 we set as 1, and X2 is 0, right? This corresponds to 1, 0, okay? And now which way does it go? Well, X1 seems to be coming down, and X2 becomes negative. So it looks to me like we're going this way, right? So when t is pi over 2, we're at this location, right? When t is pi, we're at this point. When t is 3 pi over 2, we're here. Here's when we t is 0, or t equals 2 pi, right? So. Which one would you rather uh, sort of visualize? Uh, bo both have their own uh, advantages, but this one sort of, um, I think it's, it's a little bit uh, more telling because if you change the initial conditions, if you change the, the constants, then it's going to be uh, pretty much the same, right? So if I change the constant to be Let's say we start at a point a half, right? Then when you com compute those constants, well, it's still going to be a, a circle center of the origin. And which circle can it be? It has to be going through this point, right? And what's going to be the direction? It's going to be hopefully the same direction, right? And so forth. So this resembles a little bit the, um, from one dimension, the the, the, the the solution, plotting the solutions. Except here you don't see t as an axis. Okay, you don't see the t as an axis. In fact, if you really want to see t as an axis, then what would you have to do? You have to do it in three dimensions. You have to say t is going this way. This is x1. This is x2. And now let's start on the x1 axis, right? And we're going to go. t is going to increase, right? And we're going to go uh, in a circle if we are just looking on the x1, x2 axis. So we're actually going to go in a helix, right? In this right? Very rare you'll see this because first of all it's very hard to visualize. Okay? And you know sometimes we don't we, we would need to do this. Why do you think we would need to do this? Uh, representation, or not just think about it as this representation. What's special about the the system that we talked about? X one prime equals X two, X two prime equals minus X one. Is it autonomous or non-autonomous?
It's autonomous, meaning that, again, what, is it, what does it mean it's autonomous? No T, so what does that imply? It means if you start at the time T equals zero at a, at a certain point, right, and you let the solution evolve, it's the same thing as if you were to start when T equals five at that point. Then we'll do the same thing, identical thing, right? Because the field, the direction field, has not changed. Okay? So, again, that's what it means in that picture. So that's why we can actually plot that picture and say, we don't have to start labeling T. Okay? But if I had, if I had something that's T-dependent, and I'm trying to plot the solution curves, I might actually get self-intersections in the plane because in this picture I may have, you know, the solution will be unique but when I project it and I only look at the x1, x2 plane I may get, you know, a twisted sort of curve. Okay, So we have the luxury of plotting solution curves in the plane Without, without any sort of uh, labeling of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the particular solutions, only for autonomous systems. I mean, let me put it this, um, so this rarely used as far as representing the solutions, but you know, you might have to do it if it's a uh, time dependent if it's a if it's a, um, a non-autonomous system. Okay, so let me kind of summarize this. So, um, <coughs> so for um, autonomous systems. Of two equations, um, we have this we can um, display the direction field. in the plane as well as um, the solution curves or I should say the trajectories of the, of the traces of the, of the solution curves so once again, let's see what does it mean to plot the uh, direction field. So there's no t, there's no t axis, okay? There's no t axis. So here it's a little bit different because at any point x1, x2, right? X1 prime f f1 of x1, x2. So there's no t dependence. Then what do we plot? We plot a direction. What is the direction? Well, it's going to have basically F1 to be the length here, horizontal length, and F2 to be the vertical length. And saying that a solution actually fits this direction means, you know, it's, it's probably not going to follow the direction, but it's going to have the slope in that direction at that point. Okay? And again, this comes from, in calculus 3, you actually do parameterization of the curve, right? 
So what does it mean you parameterize the curve? So solution curve is x1 and x2 of t, right? Has tangent vector. What is the tangent vector? V, which is sort of dx dt, right? So x here is x1, x2. Right, you take the derivative, you always end up in the tangent direction at that at that particular point. So this would be uh, dx1 dt, dx2 dt. Right? And I said that if we, uh, this actually is going to be the same as f1, f2 at that point, right? Now, that usually a vector comes with a direction and a, and a length, right? So sometimes the lengths in some parts of the of the um, of the field are going to be bigger than in other parts, right? So let me do this um, with the computer because it's much more accurate. So uh, let's see. I didn't show you how to download this, but I showed you how to download the uh, the direction field. That was D field seven. Well, this one is P plane P plane seven. Okay, that's really kind of powerful uh, because look, it allows you to actually type in the equation, uh, both equations, and they use x one and x two. We can change x one. Oh, excuse me, they use x and y. Can we, we can change x one, x two if you want. Um, x2, let me just do that simple one, minus x1, okay? And uh, <clears throat> it doesn't look quite round because simply because my window is not square, okay? Can everybody see this? Yeah, they're not in the center because zero and zero is here, so you can change. Okay, it doesn't matter. We can we can change the minimum values of x. Okay, um, so that's the zero zero, and this are this are directions. Now, what you see here is you kind of see that these arrows are smaller than these arrows, right? So. So, but it might not be. Uh, they might not be very accurate. In fact. I don't think they're accurate because uh, they should be growing much faster. Um, let's see. I think you have a choice to choose lines where you don't see the arrows, the length of the arrows at all, right? You don't see the vectors. You only see the directions. Okay. But in all of this, all of these options, I don't know about this. Okay, you don't see nothing. Okay, <laughs> that's not a good option. Um, in all of this, though, you can actually now fit curves to this direction field, right? So fitting a curve means you start with an initial condition, and then you follow, just like in the uh, one-dimensional case, except you don't see the t-axis. So the t-axis will sort of come out of this board, and when it's, what you see is the trace of the, right? You don't see the parameterization. In other words, you didn't know how fast it really went around the circle. Right? You would have to kind of plot it against t to see that. Okay. Uh, fortunately, there is a nice option here where you can solve, where you can show x1 versus t. So you can kind of say, uh oh, uh oh. That was not a good demo here. Wow. Um, first time it happened to me. 
Hmm. So I'll have to investigate this. Hmm. Oh well. <laughs> Maybe in the new version it didn't work or something. Um, <clears throat> it worked? So I don't know why it doesn't work here, but so you could you could actually see the previous picture I showed you where both are with respect to time. Okay. And of course you can plot several ones. Okay. So this is going to be the the well sometimes. I'll call the face portrait of that of that system. Okay, the system is written there, and this is going to be of a couple of solutions, um, but it it doesn't contain the t-dependent information. It just contains uh, like the impression of that solution that it made on the plane, right? Okay, make sense. I'll see what happens with that. Um, so, um, so what we'll concentrate on uh, is, is going to be um, <clears throat> autonomous systems. If we want to visualize, we have to have an autonomous system. Okay, um, and we're going to focus on li being linear systems. So, linear means that the variables show up in a linear fashion here. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll say more what, what it means, but let's look at uh, there, there is some so there's a linear system so that would be the most general linear system sort of you have a combination of x and y a linear combination of x and y and the first equation the second equation the right right that would be the most general linear system of course homogeneous so that zero is the only solution uh, is the only steady state. And then you can just put whatever co coefficients you have. Uh, I don't know. This was just rewritten here. And you get your direction field, right? Well, the beauty of this uh, linear system, or, or sort of a class of equations, is that you can actually predict not only what the direction field looks like, you can, but what the solutions look like, and you can solve this by hand. Period. So, of course, I'm just going to show you here how it looks like. And it doesn't look anywhere near a circle concentric to the, you know, concentric circle to the origin, right? They look more like a, like hyperbolas. And we'll, we'll be able to write this explicitly, compute this explicitly. Okay? And, of course, zero is also, zero is a fixed point. Is fixed point meaning... You plug in x and both and y equals zero, and you get a solution, right? X prime, x prime is zero, y prime is zero. This is also the only solution because um, what's a steady state? It means that the right hand side vanishes, right? So in general, would like this to um, well have only the, non, the, the, the zero zero solution. Okay, but zero zero will always be a solution. <clears throat> okay, so the question is, what what is special about those numbers that gives you this picture? And when you change those to a different system, and I don't know if I can find out, to get a totally different behavior, right? It's again not concentric, but they're more like spiraling in or out. See, well, that's where the vector, the, 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 the arrows show you. You're going in or out? Out, right? Away from the zero, from the zero. So this would be a source, right? Of course, you can make it a sink if you change all the, the sign of the thing, of, of everything. Then you get the same picture, but now it's going in, right? So you've just changed the time uh, direction, direction of time. Okay. 
And I was pretty lucky because I, I, I was able to show you a concentric hyperbola. Um, this kind of going towards us uh, or out away in a spiral way, in a spiral fashion. And there's one more. Does anybody can guess? Let's do one, one, zero, one. What happens here? Things are going out of the origin, right? But not spiraling in, right? Or spiraling out. So this is a, this is a different behavior, okay? Pretty much these are, I don't know how many there are, but three or four uh, different types of behavior that you can encounter for a system of 2 by 2 okay? Okay, and uh, let me just say now that that you know, that matrix, the 2 by 2 matrix is, is, is the only one that you need to study to, to identify which behavior you have and how to solve the system. Okay? And it is connected with the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that particular matrix. So we're going to have to do some uh, linear algebra here so we can um, understand this a little bit better. Okay? So, so I don't know, if I had more time I would just copy this um, but I won't do it now because I don't know. Eh. There was a way to do this. Okay. Oh, of course. Wrong uh, button is going to give you the wrong thing, right? So. All right, so that's just an example of um, <clears throat> okay. So everybody uh, is 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 clear on this uh, direction field. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now, what happens before I, I, I go to these linear systems? Uh, what happens if I if I show you something that's nonlinear? What would be something nonlinear? Well, something nonlinear is again in this gallery. There are lots of them. You can take a look. But it's the pendulum. That's the one I was uh, mentioning the first time. And it's theta prime equals omega, and omega prime equals minus sine. Right. So that's nonlinear. You agree with that? If you don't like theta, let's call it x1, x2, x2, minus sine of x1. And there's also a term dx2, so, but let's say d equals 0, so ignore that, right? So this, this system is, so nonlinear pendulum is um, x1 prime equals x2, x2 prime equals minus sine of x1, which as a second order equation looks x1 double prime plus sine of x1 equals 0. So that's different than the one above, right? Where there's no sine. That was linear, this is nonlinear. There's no solution that you can write for this system, explicit solution, right? So you just go to, uh, I guess, to the computer to see how it, the portrait looks like. <clears throat> and again, I don't know if you can see it very well, um, but at zero zero there is a steady state. If you plug in x one equals zero, x two equals zero, you got a solution, right? But if you're away from that, then you get what appears to be like a circle, but it's not an, a circle, okay? 
it's not a circle. Uh, you c the further you go to zero, the more you see that it's not a circle, right? But these curves, and they're closed curves, they follow this direction field, okay? It's just we have, we have no, no explicit way of writing the solution. And it's not a terribly complicated system. You can write it by hand, right? But it has no x1 of t equals this and x2 of t equals that. But now watch. Um, if I want to go... Uh, I picked the wrong number. No, it never stops. It does eventually. Thank you. It's helpful. Um, Okay, you can see uh, the error is building up, piling up, because what what should happen is you should have again a closed closed curve. Okay. Wow. Um, again, it's the first time it happens to me. Does. But on the opposite side. Mm. You have to get a certain length out to have that happen. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry for that. Um, <clears throat> let, me, let me try to stay away from the trouble points. Um, so again, this is going to be the picture. I'm playing with fire here. All right, so that's ah, looks like that area is, is uh, full of errors. Anyway, so that's right. So this looks different than the linear system. Okay. Uh, again, it's simply you know uh, clever ways of fitting uh, the curves with that field that's already there. Now you can already see if the field were time dependent. It would be a mess. You first you couldn't you couldn't plot the direction field. Because the direction field would, would change. I mean you could if you are to take frames, for instance, at time of vault, right? But the field would change. Like wind would blowing right there. And then you would have a solution in the starting at the initial point, and they would have to adjust to that changing field. Okay? So it'd be very hard to plot this kind of things. Okay? So it's a very kind of um, you know, special way of, 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 of plotting solutions. Now, there's a, we're going to talk more about, you know, what the actual meaning of this is when you go back to the physical system like the pendulum, but like you have, you have stable solutions, you have unstable solutions, uh, I mean sinks and sources. Um, I hate another one of those points. So, but, um, uh, let's see. But now I just want to show you one more thing where this D, which is going to be play the role of some friction, is not zero, no longer zero. It's like uh, one. Okay. Then the direction field it's not doesn't tell you much, right? But you have to plot a few solutions, and you can see the solutions are doing something. Depending on where you are, the solutions actually approach one of these steady states, right? So it's, 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 there's lots of sinks here, right? So for nonlinear systems, this is a zoo. The, I mean, the, the behavior of the system is actually can be extremely complex. Extremely complex and extremely un unpredictable. I mean, um, Van der Poel equation, if you've done linear circuits, and we're going to talk a little more about this, is, is one, another example. Um, the right-hand side is, I don't know if you can see it here, it's like a, it's a linear x, y, but then it has a nonlinear x cubed in it. And y prime is x, okay? And let's not think about the second order equ uh, equivalent, but it just has this kind of, behavior and take a look at this. 
This is again autonomous. So this, what you see at this time, you're going to see it at, after an hour. Right? The direction field doesn't change. Solutions, though, starting at a point, are going to evolve with time. And you can see what happens. They're not going toward a point. They're going toward a so-called limit cycle. So in other words, there is looks like there is a periodic solution. And if you're inside, you're also going towards that periodic solution. Again, the errors should, would tell this. You know, towards as t goes to negative infinity, they go to zero. But as t going um, to plus infinity goes away from zero. And that's another example of that uniqueness. If you have a periodic solution, that means it bounds a certain region, right? And you start inside of the region. Can you escape the region in the plane? Not unless you have non-uniqueness, right? Because you have, you'd, have you'd have to cross this boundary. So any solution starting inside cannot go somewhere out, outside, right? And uh, of course, there's something else to say about you know why does it then go towards the limiting cycle? You know why not just going to a smaller limiting cycle? Well, there has to be a smaller limiting cycle. So, so anyway, there's there's more to say. So there's Poincaré map uh, type of arguments, but uh, <clears throat> you can kind of see the different behavior of this nonlinear system just from the face face portrait. Okay, and many times it's very hard to do it by hand. Okay, I mean it's just impossible. Okay, so this whole course is basically how do how can you s analyze a system, right, with whatever tools are you know analytic tools. What can you say about stability of of steady states, uh, about existence of limit cycles, and um, and also combination of using computers when you kind of run out of uh, ideas. Okay, so <coughs> uh, let me close this by saying, let's look at a, at a steady state here. And this, this system has a steady state. How do we find steady states? Steady states are points where the, the right-hand side of the system vanishes. That is when x and y are both constant, right? So derivatives have to be zero. So if you solve this algebraic system, right? You have a system of differential equations. Right-hand side both equal to zero gives you a system of algebraic equations. Still nonlinear, so it's not. It may be very complicated, but here it's easy. X equals zero, and Y have both have to be zero, right? If you solve for X and uh, for the both right hand sides equals zero, so you, you can kind of see that that zero zero is the only steady state, okay? Um, find an equilibrium point. I mean, the, this software hope. <sighs> okay, there's something wrong. Uh, Something very wrong. Um, I'll, I'll fix this. So. Um, yeah. Because you can actually find the, st the steady state, okay? And when it finds the steady state, it also gives you what's called a linearized version of this of the system around the steady state. And around the steady state, what do you see? Like if you just focus around the zero zero state, what are you going to see? One of those previous picture, which is one of those behaviors, either going in, spiraling in, right, or going out, spiraling out, or in this case, I think it's it's not spiraling in, but it's kind of going. You see, there's a kind of a direction that's kind of um, predominant, and everything else is kind of coming out of that in that with that direction. Okay. So, in every nonlinear system, there is going to be a linearized version that we're going to be focusing on. Okay, so that's another reason why one starts with um, with linear systems.
Okay. So let me quickly say this. So, so the most general um, linear system, two by two, would be. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's use x and y. And here's just we gotta we gotta make a convention. We use x one, x two, or do we use, do we use x and y? Um, Let's use X and Y for now. Okay. So A, B, C, and D are constants. So they form a matrix A, B, C, D. It's called the coefficient matrix. Okay, and oftentimes we put x and y in a, in a column, and we say this is the um, well, this is the unknown. This is x becomes a function of time, and that's the unknown that we need to solve for. Okay, so the system. system can be written as x prime equals a times x. This is in matrix form. Okay, so again, what is x prime? Is x, x prime and y prime? I mean, capital X prime is little x prime and little y prime, right? A is a, b, c, d, and x is x and y is a column. Okay? That's a very useful way of writing a system because as we'll see, when, once we have the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix A, then we pretty much can, can write the solution of the system. So, what is the role of eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the matrix A? Well, <clears throat> let me remind you, what is the eigenvalue? Eigenvalue is lambda for A if the determinant of A minus lambda identity, in this case 2 by 2 identity, is 0. Okay? So that's how you find the eigenvalues. And that's a quadratic equation in lambda. So you can find two real solutions, one double solution, or two complex conjugate solutions. Right, so the eigenvalues may be may be complex. Um, X is an eigenvector corresponding to eigenvalue lambda if a x equals lambda x. And, and of course, x is not, not not a zero vector, so we don't have. Of course, zero vector would sort of that would satisfy that uh, automatically. So we need <coughs> to solve this. And uh, let's see, how many how many of you is, um, well have never seen this? How to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a matrix two by two? Good. So. Um, I'll, I'll show you an example real quick if I have time. But let me let me just write what's what's the meaning what's the uh, uh, role of this. Let's say we have um, say uh, x one x one and lambda one are uh, eigenvectors 
well, okay, eigenvectors and a corresponding eigenvalue. So are such that ax1 equals lambda1 x1. Okay, and I'm going to use this index because hopefully there's going to be a, a second uh, eigenvalue and a second eigenvector. Well, let's let's just take one such this. Then we claim that um, a solution of the our of our equation x prime equals ax is given by x of t equals let me write x1 of t here equals e to the lambda 1 t x1 so in other words this is a fixed vector and this gets multiplied by a scalar that you know is of an exponential type so it grows or decays depending on how lambda is positive or negative right but the important thing is if I plot this in that uh, x1, x2 pl or xy plane, how is this going to look? Let's say x1 is here. Actually, it's going to be on the, the in this direction of x1. It's going to be uh, right when t goes to negative infinity. Let's say lambda is positive. Then it would be going this way, right? So it's in a straight line. That's the important thing. This, this, the graph of this of this solution is a straight line. Okay. Now I did I did both ways because I was, uh, you know. Eventually, you're going to have to multiply by an arbitrary constant, so it could be plus or minus. Okay. But it's a straight line. If there are two solutions, if excuse me, if lambda one, um, if there are two distinct eigenvalues, lambda one, lambda two and corresponding eigenvectors x1, x2 for the matrix A, then we claim the following, that um, the general solution of x prime equals ax is x of t equals a linear combination of this c1 e to the lambda 1 t x1 plus c2 e to the lambda 2 t x2 with c1 c2 arbitrary constants scalar so in other words the picture will look the following way. If I have two distinct eigenvalues, two distinct and real, I should say, right? Did I say real? Real. So let's say x, um, let's say x1 and x2 are both positive, just for the illustration. Then I have two eigenvectors So two directions, right? <clears throat> and let's say I have lambda one. Um, positive. Well, let's say lambda one is negative and lambda two is positive. Then what do you think is going to look like? Well, along lambda one, this is going to be decreasing because the exponential factor is decreasing right when lambda one is negative it's going down I mean towards zero for x for lambda two is going increasing right 
So if I start with the initial condition on this line, on this on this eigen direction, then it's going to go s like straight towards the origin, right? Never reach the origin, but goes towards the origin. Same here. If I start here, it's going to go away from the origin. So the only question is, what happens if I start somewhere that's not on the axis? Well, the formula is going to give you the constant C1 and C2 so that you know the solution starts at that point. And you can kind of see there is a component that kind of takes you to zero, x1. So that's the first comp that's the component that goes to zero, and that's the component that goes to infinity. So it looks it's going to look just like the picture we had. So it's So in other words, the, the, the picture is, is actually captured by that general solution. Different constants will give you different curves. Of course, for, uh, to find out a, a specific curve that goes to a specific point, just like solving an uh, initial value problem, you'd have to find the, the, con the values of the constants C1 and C2. Okay? And this is for real, eigen, uh, real eigenvalues, distinct eigenvalues, right? There's going to be a picture for um, repeated eigenvalues, so that's real but repeated. There's going to be another picture for complex conjugate eigenvalues. Okay? Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll continue this, but I, I've assigned a few problems that uh, don't really ask you to uh, go into plotting a lot of things, but just kind of find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for, for two by two metrics. So hopefully it's not too hard. Could you draw a couple lines?